Being mortal, we have to be concerned with material aspects of our life. Earning money so that we can eat, clothe ourselves and have somewhere to sleep. And also to be able to go on courses. <laughs> Why is there so often so much difficulty experienced in mundane matters that make it difficult to pursue spiritual goals? And what is the right way to relate to material things from the angle of being on a spiritual path so that we can obtain support instead of obstruction? Good. The answer would be, are you ready for that spiritual support? All difficulties would arise because of lack of readiness. And who says that uh, material needs are not necessary? They are totally necessary. Fine. Now, being on this spiritual path does not mean one must shirk all one's worldly responsibilities. The body needs food. After all, what is your body? Nothing but food. It's the food that's eaten by a person that produces the muscles and the blood cells and all that. And all these things are necessary. And you know the, the saying that uh, the world owes you a living, but you've got to work for it. You've got to work. Now, work is also a form of spirituality. To do one's job well can lead you to the highest spiritual goals. A doctor does his work dedicatedly and with, filled with devotion can also become a spiritual path. A shoemaker puts all of his energies and whatever power he has within in him to make that pair of shoes to such perfection that in the very making of it he brings forth that eternal spiritual energy that is within him. Hmm? Now, many people want to be on a spiritual path not with total dedication but with wishful thinking that I wish I was on the spiritual path, and because I wish that, hmm, I am on the spiritual path. Now, a wishful thinker is not necessarily a seeker. Now, that very search you have in you must bring about certain difficulties. Because, as I said many times, that in this worldly life, there are always polarities. The more you try and pull in the right direction, the wrong direction has some hold over you and tries to hold you back. And the reason is due to, due to your own making. Remember, we are creatures not of just today, but of many, many lives before us. And we are set in certain grooves, uh, certain modes of thinking, certain ways. Now one has to overcome that by exercising strict discipline within ourselves. Discipline is necessary until the time that we are well established on the spiritual path, then discipline, conscious discipline, does not become necessary because your life itself is a discipline. Hmm? Not within the norms of man-made laws, but within the norms of spiritual laws. Hmm? Where everything you do is just right. And it's just right for your personal spiritual evolution, your personal spiritual unfoldment. So, when there are these difficulties, they must be welcomed. Because difficulty is the greatest teacher in life. If you had all the happiness and things that you think you need, or you want, rather, then you would forget God. You'd forget divinity. 
You never remember divinity when you're totally happy. Hmm? And no one is really totally happy. But you remember divinity most when you are in trouble. Then you say, oh God, hmm? what a life, what a business. If you are so merciful, O oh Lord, then why all these troubles and difficulties? But the poor Lord has nothing to do with our difficulties. The Lord does not give you pleasure and he does not give you pain. Hmm? It is a neutral energy given to you as your birthright from which you have originated and you are that divine energy. But here, because of all the conditionings of the experiences of previous lives and in this life, you block the divinity from shining through. Hmm? So it is you, you and no one but you, that produces this divinity. Now, the aim of these talks and spiritual practices is to bring about a certain understanding hmm, of the difficulties. Hmm? For as we do know that every adversity contains within itself an opportunity. Hmm? Now, what do we see? Do we see the advers uh, adversities only or do we see the opportunities? Now, if our attention through understanding is led to the opportunities, the sting of the difficulties and advert uh, adversities disappear. Mm. They just disappear. And all difficulties people have are normally exaggerated. There is really no foundation in a difficulty, a little perhaps, and that is necessary to goad you on. And if, and if that was not there, you would just become a vegetable, a non-thinking being hmm? that will not be able to function. So, if you have some difficulty, May you have some more. <laughs> it keeps man awake. Hmm? If I have a business, and the business would run on its own, hmm? no opposition, no competition, I'll become so self-satisfied hmm? that the business will not progress. But if there's competition, it will bring, put me on my toes, I'll be on my toes to try and overcome competition and do better. And that's how the business will expand. Otherwise, expansion is not possible. So likewise, in our lives, difficulties are there for expansion, for greater awareness, for greater understanding of life. So difficulty is a blessing in disguise. But when man's mind is wrapped up totally in the difficulty, hmm, then he loses balance. He just sees darkness and not the light. He sees the adversities and not the opportunities that are there in those very so-called adversities. No man in this world has difficulties if you look at it from the right angle. Hmm? They are lessons to be learned. Hmm? Forever, after all, is life not but a school. If, if your whole mental makeup, if your whole karmic self was not composed of difficulties, you would have not taken on this body, you, you would have not taken on this birth. The sole purpose of this life, I'm not referring to great saints and sages who purposely take on life and difficulties like, like Christ did or Krishna or Buddha did or Mahavir did. They purposely take on an incarnation, a life, to be able to help people and give them some understanding of what difficulty really is, to take the sting out of difficulty. Hmm? So the snake of difficulty will bite. Ah, but if you have taken out the poison from its fangs, hmm, it won't poison you. 
So why should we live poisoned lives and get our minds entwined in those difficulties all the time? Now this comes through understanding. And understandings are, of course, realizations. And a realization is nothing but an understanding gained and assimilated. And when it is assimilated, when it forms part and parcel of the entire process of our mind and body, then it is called assimilation. Then you have really digested it. For assimilation will have no digestion. It is only when food is not well assimilated into the system that you have uh, indigestion. You see. So, how do we overcome these difficulties? Hmm? Whatever they might be. Fine. Hard work. Nothing comes without hard work. Hmm? Could be mental work. Until you have reached this stage where you don't need to work hard anymore. You just think hard and things happen. So everything is governed by the mind. And I've told you this many times that a thought is a thing. And if that thought is well concentrated, and that is why you have been given the Tratak practice, the candle practice, whereby without concentrating you gather all your mental energies to one focal point. Hmm? which brings about visualization. If man can visualize anything he wants, anything he needs, hmm, that very visualization is a subtle happening of that which you want. And that very visual visualization concretizes itself in what you want. Hmm? Say a man wants to attain God, or say, you, or rather, he wants to make a million pounds. Hmm? Now, this is possible for everyone. Within five years, you can do it. Hmm? Is your thought force strong enough? Is your yearning strong enough? Have you got that burning desire whereby you want to put in all your energies to that aim in view? to that goal and you'll find that your mind will be so conditioned that automatically because of the conditioning of the mind in that direction and because of bringing all those thoughts together into one force things will happen to you without you even consciously wanting it to happen that's the secret of worldly living Therefore, we do the candle practice, which is a very, very important practice. It has been practiced for thousands of years in the East, where all the mental energies, without effort, are gathered together into one focal point. And once one becomes habituated in that, then everything we do in life will always become a focal point with total concentration. So, we have one difficulty, you need a roof, shelter, you need food, you need clothes, you need this, that. Now, let that not be wishful thinking. Hmm? But I want that do something about it. Because when you translate a thought into action, you are automatically implanting that thought further and further into your subconscious so that not only in the waking state but also in the sleeping state it works and helps you along. We have these experiences that anything we think about comes into reality. So there is no difficulty but our failure to see the beauty of the energy that is within us not understanding it and not allowing it free reign to play. And that is what is meant by nature is always supporting us, but we block Mother Nature from supporting us. That is the trouble. 
So, why dwell on difficulties? Dwell on the opposite of difficulties. Hmm? Think of those. Develop constructive ideas. Hmm? If someone's business is running at a loss or is in the red, it is not going to help thinking of the red figures on the bank statement. No. What am I going to do to overcome it? I am not going to wait for any spiritual signs and all these things that will fall out from heaven. There's no such thing. Mental quirks. We do not wait for signs. Do or die. Ah. Hmm? I want to be out of this problem and I'm going to do my best to get out of it. Even if I have to work 24 hours of the day and I'm going to get out of it. Now, if one has that aim and that determination, there are no difficulties in life. Hmm? So, firstly, we have to understand that these difficulties are created by me and no one else. There is no outside agency. Hmm? You'd say, oh, a friend of mine did me down. Hmm? Really speaking, not. You attracted that. Yes, always. Always. Because if you did not, if you had the resistance, that external force will not affect you. Hmm? And then, as we said, what is life without the fun and pleasure of difficulties? Because it is joy too. Hmm? Everything that happens is a joy. Huh? And it is our attitude in life, how we look at things, that determines of the outcome of that so-called difficulty. Hmm? Like you know the, the stanza which I've been repeating, oh, it's my favorite one, I've repeated it all over and over again, with two men behind prison bars, one saw mud, the other saw stars. Huh? I've repeated that a million times. I love it so much. Two people in the same circumstances, hmm? meaning the same difficulty. Hmm? But one could see the glory and the other the gloom. Hmm? So, that is the way out of any difficulty. Hmm? I knew a man that used to do door-to-door -door peddling. And he tried to work on the sentiment of people. And afterwards they nicknamed him Uncle Bad Luck. Uh, every time he used to come and knock on someone's door to sell something, he said, oh, there comes Uncle Bad Luck, an old man. And he built up such a resistance and aura around him that he might have the best things to sell. Uh, 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 at a reasonable price, but nobody would buy it. They just shirk away from him. And that's how his nickname stuck. Because he went with a negative attitude. These people are not going to buy, but let me go. You see how wrong. Then, I've heard of a Jewish friend. He used to sell corduroy cloth. Now, you know, corduroy cloth has a smell to it. So knock on the door, and the lady of the house would come. And this is lovely cloth, madam, reasonable price. Mm, I got these things as a bargain. <laughs> mm, I gave it to you. Mm. And the madam at the door would say, oh, but this cloth stings. He says, no, no, madam, cloth don't sting, I stink. <laughs> that forceful, positive attitude made his sales for him. Same thing, applying for a job. If you go there with the idea, oh, I'm not going to get this, you are not going to get it. Hmm? They say, oh, I'm definitely going to get it. You look at the boss in his eyes and tell him, you're going to hire me. Yeah? You don't say it aloud, perhaps, depending what kind of person he is. <laughs> but have that in your mind. Hmm? Before you go in for the interview, you just do five or ten minutes of Guru Shakti, feel invigorated, ah. There's a part of grace with me too. I'm not alone. You are not alone. Never alone. Hmm? 
So who talks of difficulties? Bull. <laughs> you see? Hmm? And then, and that's the first understanding. And the second understanding is this, that every difficulty is to teach us some lesson in life. Hmm? Do you think uh, my life has no difficulties? Plenty. Hmm? There's this chiller with this problem and that chiller with that problem and you're worrying about this one. Yes, a long distance call from America from someone and she tells me myself and my boyfriend has broken up and what must I do? Hmm? See? No difficulties. So I explained how to overcome that and what to do and how to develop the attitude whereby the sting would be gone. Mm -hmm. So these things happen in life all the time because we are in the world. How we look at it, that is our business. No one else's. And once we develop uh, the positive attitude, if you wish to call it, once we develop some little understanding, some little realization, then these difficulties fade away automatically. They just fade away. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're wanting to have a job, a place to stay, just make up your mind. What the devil, I'm going to find that job. Even if I have to start chopping wood, it's still something. It's activity. And once one gets habituated into activity, then activity will go on and on and on and on to better things. And those difficulties are alleviate, alleviated. But if one wants to sit and just mope and worry about difficulties, you'll still be in the same mess that you think you are in. Hmm? Good. So, spiritual practices help one to gain that strength of thinking in a proper way. A right thinking and right action. Now by this we mean a proper attitude towards the situation in question and acting on it and not sitting still. Because the proper attitude, the right thinking, naturally must bring about a right action. And that is the secret of life. That is the way out of all difficulties. Some person is ill, and the person thinks, oh, look at this difficulty I am in. Firstly, accept the fact that this illness has been brought about by myself. Now let me do something the reverse of that, so that I would feel better. I was discussing this morning, um, of these positive affirmations that helps the mind to put it in different grooves hmm? because everyone wants peace hmm? peace that passeth all understanding hmm? now this can come about by grace it's no use sitting there and say, Grace, come, Grace, come. And she's a naughty girl, she won't. <laughs> you see? But make yourself attractive. Hmm? Don't walk around with a three-day beard and, hmm? and, and bad temper. Grace is not going to come and visit you. And she won't allow you to visit her either. So, in order to make ourselves conducive to grace, and grace is all around, we can't even lift our hand or breathe without the power of grace. But are we doing anything to make ourselves conducive and receptive to the grace which is there, free of charge? It is just us. If the receptacle is open, the water can be filled in it. But if it is closed, how can it? You see. So, the difficulties, they have a relative existence. Hmm? A very relative existence. And most difficulties are just mental projections. People find difficulties 
where there are no difficulties in reality. Hmm? It is an assumption. Fears, for example, is such a difficulty too. Hmm? It produces difficulties. And what do people fear? And what's going to happen to me tomorrow, day after, day after? Hmm? Now that is not the way of thinking. Hmm? Think of now, today. Hmm? What am I going to do today? Forget tomorrow. And those difficulties will disappear. It's such a simple thing. And um, psychologists make a very big thing of it. Hmm? They do. Now, these difficulties, as we said, are necessary to keep people awake, to keep them alive. Because you will always have in the entire universe the principle of expansion and contraction. And this very conflict that expansion and contraction produces is what we regard as difficulty. Because conflict is difficulty. Now, the conflict itself exaggerates the difficulty. Any person, any person could be old or young, does not need to worry about a plate of food. It is there. It's not going to be delivered to your doorstep uh, unless you become uh, a great psychic being where you command the elements hmm, and manifest food by the waving of a hand. Hmm, there are psychic people that can do that. Those psychic powers can be developed. Hmm, but a spiritual person won't. He allows his mind and body to work in the world because that is in the world. But then he infuses it with the spiritual force that is in him so that everything assumes a beautiful shape. Everything becomes very beautiful. For example, if you go, and go to the cinema and if you're in a bad mood, you won't enjoy the film. But if you are in a good mood, you are going to enjoy the film. So, so much is dependent upon you. So much is dependent upon you and the very frame of your mind, the very frame, the very basis of your understanding will give you the perspective to look at a thing adversely or conducively. So that is how difficulties just come about. Hmm? So, when there are difficulties, people mope so unnecessarily. Hmm? We have a friend here hmm? in this hall that has the attitude from very young days that things will just come my way. And they do. He has that approach to life, that positive approach. Hmm? He loses one contract and he says, oh, tomorrow I'll get another one. He's not let down by it. These things happen. And he gets it. Because whatever we lose or we get is because of our own mental attitude towards things. And that we're talking of mundane things. Of mundane things. A man has an appointment during the week for a contract. Hmm? And he goes there with that attitude, I am going to get it. Even if the first I have to get, got to cut my price. Huh? Hmm? Right, I'll have a little loss, so I'll just cover. Next I'll build up the price a bit, because they'll know what kind of service I can give, and I'll get all the other contracts from that company thereafter. And then I will make up hmm, what I should have made this year. And 10, 15, 20 times more. You see how it works. I talk of practical things, practical examples, problems of people, things that they think about or worry about. Hmm? So, there is no difficulty as such. Most difficulties are just assumed difficulties. If any young, strong, healthy man worries about making a living and shelter over his head, I don't know, he must have his head examined. 
Yes, yes. Where is those? Two? Where, where, where are our teachings? Hmm? Where are those teachings that we've been learning for all these years? Hmm? If we worry about these little things, they must come. Hmm? You see, simple, really. So, what do we do when we face difficulties? Is have the proper attitude, analyze it. Hmm? That, that how difficult is this difficulty? It's not. And when we start analyzing it, we will know that it can be overcome. We find ways and means of overcoming it. And it will be overcome. Because you are the master of life. You are the master of the entire universe. You are divine. You are divine. And things which are not conducive to yourself is necessary. And then secondly we say, well, this is a lesson I'm learning. Why shouldn't I? Perfected beings have things in their lives and they recognize it that this is a must, this is necessary, this is keeping me awake. This will make me strive harder for what I aim to do. Hmm? And did Christ not have difficulties in his life? Huh? He was crucified. Hmm? But how did he take it? Hmm? Hmm? How did he take it? Even his murderers, he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Hmm? So here was compassion. Here was compassion because... He knew that these people are acting so childishly. And they're acting from their level, their small little level. Hmm? And how can you blame them? How can you blame them? You can't blame a child in, in this, um, form four to know the work of an MA or a PhD. You can't. They're working at their level. If we have that understanding then we can only flow with love and compassion to those that are creating difficulties, that we think are creating difficulties for us. In reality, they're not. They have their own quirks, they have their own shortcomings, but how am I going to react to someone else's shortcomings? That is my business. Because I must overcome what I think is difficult for me. Hmm? Good. So let them react the way they want to or do what they want to. But I must be steadfast and firm. Hmm? So we're analyzing this from one's personal point of view and also from some other one's point of view. Hmm? And if we can love others deeply enough, sincerely enough, then even they that produce difficulties later, as they learn more in life, they say, oh, we are so sorry that we did this to such and such a person. Mm -hmm. And that is a great learning for them too. So, by your love, you are teaching them also. Mm -hmm. You're teaching them also, you're also uplifting them in spite of them. Hmm? producing difficulties in your path. Hmm? Now, is that not a great act of charity? Hmm? So, to be charitable, hmm? to be charitable is not putting a silver coin in the collection box. That's not charity. It helps along. Hmm? Helps along a bit. But that is not real charity. Real charity comes from giving of oneself totally with love even to thine enemies. Hmm? Now, these theological principles have great value. Hmm? The whole idea is by spiritual practices to rise above the difficulties. Hmm? The waves on the surface of, ocean, of the ocean do not bother or disturb the calmness that is deep down in the ocean. So we have to reach a deeper level within ourselves hmm? 
by meditation and spiritual practices, we reach that level. If we are established in meditation, we reach that level and then whatever happens on the surface means nothing. And when we have that attitude, when we have that attitude and reach that calmness within, then all the surface thing assumes no importance. And actually you help the waves to become calm because the surface waves to become calm because you have the calmness inside. You see? So simple, so simple. A simple point gets lost. We always try to achieve that we find it difficult. But we start with the simpler things of life. When that simplicity is realized, then everything around us becomes simple. Because divinity is simple, it is uncompounded, it is not a mixture. It is, difficulties arise within oneself because conflict of various emotions. Now when we mix up various emotions through our experiences of course, then various kinds of conflicts arise within ourselves and that is the greatest difficulty. Now, you cannot fight all these emotions one by one because they form an integral part of each other. One stimulates or regenerates the other. So, we tackle it from a different angle. We tackle it from the spiritual angle whereby when spiritual energies are drawn from within ourselves, drawn out, so that those very emotions get flooded by this energy and those emotions get calmed. Hmm? Get calmed. We know of difficulties, even tragedies in people's lives. Hmm? Tragedies. But yet they are so happy. Hmm? So happy that the tragedies don't bother them, or bother them at all because they have gained that strength from inside which automatically brings about a greater awareness to their minds. Their perception changes and the perspective to life is also so well changed. They come to the realization that nothing is bad. Nothing is bad in this life. Something might not be conducive to one for a particular time, in a particular time. Hmm? But is it bad in reality? If divinity is omnipresent, hmm? that means present everywhere in every atom, then how could it just be wrong? Hmm? How can it be bad? How can it be difficult? For divinity is joy itself but our interpretation of it because of our surface conditioning. And then remember the mind is nothing but on the surface of the spirit. Hmm? It forms the obstacles, the veils. So, we have to control the mind. Now, mental control, there are many schools of thought that teach certain kinds of rigid mental control. Hmm? Now, that very rigidity hmm, can produce far greater problems hmm, because you take the mind out from one particular mold and you put it into another mold. So it is still bogged down, it is still tied down. hmm, And as we said, molds are binding. So, the only way to free oneself from those molds, from those patterns, is to infuse it with the power that is within. And all difficulties fade away. And then you can sit back and think, I need a job, and you get that job. 
I need that home, get that home. We were discussing yesterday with someone that divinity gives you what you need and not what you want. Hmm? Yes. And all needs in life, true needs, are legitimate. You have the right to it. You have the right to have a job. You have the right to earn a living. Hmm? Oh yes. But people become lazy and go into wishful thinking and hmm, that things must just drop down in the lap. And that is why people suffer and bring greater and greater miseries to themselves. Hmm? Greater and greater miseries to themselves, created by themselves. And then of course they blame everything, everybody around them. They blame the husband, they blame the wife, they blame the children. And when that doesn't work, they blame God, that he's so unjust. Hmm? He's a neutral force, as we said just now. So the thing is to pull one's pants up, I mean socks up. Yeah. Now, there was this, um, to go on a lighter vein, uh, there was this teacher, preacher, and Oscar Wilde, the great English humorist, thought, I'm going to play a joke hmm, on this preacher. So after the talk was over, the sermon was over, uh, Oscar Wilde said, oh, that was very, very beautiful. But everything you said, you know, I have it, every word you said, I have it in a book. So the, the preacher says, that, that's impossible. Hmm? That's impossible. How can you have that? It, hmm? My talk is not published in any book. He says, no, I've got every word. So the preacher says, show me the book. Hmm? He says, okay, I'll send it to you tomorrow. Hmm? Every word I've got it in this book. I'll send it to you tomorrow. And then next day he sent a book. It was the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Next question. And then to this to this one fellow uh, fell asleep during the church service. So he said, Oh, you know, Robinson was snoring so much during the service. So the other fellow says, I know. He works me up. Guruji, <laughs> how can we differentiate between free will and karma? It's so easy often then to say, oh, that was my karma. Was it? Also, is there been murder karma? Or is it just someone else's free will? And how do we learn not to procrastinate when faced with a situation come on? Mm -hmm. The basis of the question is, what is the difference between free will and karma? Firstly, karma has been produced because of free will. Divine will does not produce any karma, for divine will is non-binding, but free will can be binding. Now, there can be good karma and bad karma. So they both are binding. Because all karma has nothing to do with the spiritual self of man. Karma has only to do with the mental self of man. So when, as you said, if a person murders, is it his karma to murder? Is it his karma to kill? Now, it depends who is killing. Now, if a lion kills a man, then it is not karma of the lion, because that is his duty, his natural way. He is forced 
by the processes of nature, he kills, he eats. No lion ever kills anyone uh, for the fun of it. It is killed the deer or anything for self sustenance, for food. Now, man does not do that. Why does man commit a murder? For by committing that very act, he is adding to his karma. But what were the conditions before he did that? So, the murder is not because of past karma, but because of past mental conditioning. Now, how was that mental conditioning brought about? Because of his past karma. So who laid the egg? Who comes first, the chicken or the hen? Chicken. Okay. So everything is karma, and everything is not karma. Now when we talk of free will, what do we mean by free will? Free will means that you have thought power. And because of that thought power, you have the freedom to do what you like. That means free will. You decide on something good or bad, and you do it. You do it because of free will. Now, karma does condition free will. For it is because of your past experiences in life and in previous life that you can think in a certain manner. Now, if your experiences in life and conditioning were such that it would make you think today of doing good work, of helping people, constructive work, then you'd be doing constructive work spontaneously. But if your condition is such that you do destructive things, okay, then that too is done spontaneously. Okay. Many a murderer, at least all of them, okay, do not do that because they want to do it. Okay. There is a compulsion in them, a need to for some personal gain, perhaps, or to satisfy a mental aberration that this act is performed. There is this imbalance in the subconscious mind that comes to the core in the conscious mind that makes him perform this action, although the conscious mind will argue the pros and cons the conscious mind will stop him from committing a certain act, but the conditions of the subconscious will override the conscious thinking, and he will do that. How much is he to blame for that? He is to blame, not because of his conscious self, because his conscious self is in conflict, but he is to blame for the subconscious self that contains the seed and the thought for him to override the conscious pros and cons and make him perform the act. But the subconscious levels that are there contain all the thought patterns and experience mm -hmm. He might have had some experience where he was hurt or even killed. And then the subconscious that lingers on after the body has been discarded, discarded wanted revenge. And that very sense that is born within the pattern is what we know as moralism. Now, how is he to curb? that instinct. How is he to stop from committing that act? Because if he does 
not commit that act, he can go insane. And most of the killers are in reality psychopaths. How is he to curb that? If he curbs it consciously, then he will suffer the depression in himself, which will drive him insane. So, this is where the conscious mind, although forced by the inner compulsion, can do something. Can do something. When the conscious mind argues the urge in consciousness of some willful act which we call free will, which we call free will, willful act, so that person needs help. To help, not to alter his subconscious mind, but to strengthen the good thought in his conscious mind, so that that person himself can get that good thought deeper down and alter his subconscious pattern. Then he will not feel it. Many people that have these tendencies, I believe, should not be veiled, but should be treated. Now, what is the what is the free will relation to karma? Can you alter your karma to a free will? No, you can't alter your karma. For what you have sown, you will have to do. But you can put the same momentum in a different direction. The same force that is there within the subconscious can be diverted into a different channel very consciously. And for this again, great understanding is required. That means that we are not changing our karma, but we are changing the force of our karma. We are changing the direction, rather, of our karma. For what has been wound up, and karma is only a winding up that has to be unwound. How is it to be done? That is the question. How do we unwind the karmic debt so that we do not suffer the consequences so much? I've seen some talk somewhere that if you kill ten people, it would not mean that you will have to be killed ten times. Use the free will, the conscious analytical powers you have, and save 11 lives. Then the repent of killing the 10 will be up. There are no particular karma that will have its effect. No cause will have its effect. In a similar way, your free will has the ability to change the effect in a different way. And yet, the momentum, the force of karma, will not be lost. It will be there. But by being available, by gaining the understanding we have spoken about, we alter the course of that karma, which could be progressive for us. Evolutionary wise, it could be progressive. So the difficulty is to have certain current values. And that is why man has been given this thing in mind. You're talking of the average man. You're not talking of the aberrated mind that cannot think right. You're talking of the average person. So, 
by the thought of his free will, by gaining proper understanding, By the proper understanding and the thought of his free will, he changes the course of his kind. Now, how is this understanding gained? We ask so many ways. Understanding can be gained, knowledge can be gained by the delight from those that know. It has to be convincing for the mind to be pleased. That is one way to approach it. The other way is surrender. Mm-hmm. Where you say, not my will, but thy will be done. Mm-hmm. Now, free will is always ego orientated. Mm-hmm. We call it free, mm-hmm. but that's the misnomer. The will is not free. The will, which we call free will, is just a reflection of our personal conditioned ego. So instead of free will, it would be more appropriate to call it ego will. Yeah. It's not going to be found in the ego. For underlying that ego, there is still a divine will. Yeah. There's still a divine will. And in order to develop that kind of surrender where we can truly say, Thy will be done, it would mean that the so called free will has to merge into the divine will. Otherwise, it is just thinking uselessly of no avail or value. Hmm? What is the procedure and how do we merge the so-called free will into the divine will? It comes about not by annihilation or destruction of the ego, for that is impossible. The ego can never be destroyed or annihilated. But the ego can be clarified made more cleaner, more transparent, so that by spiritual practices, when our ego becomes transparent, the light of the divine will shine through. So when the light of the divine will shines through, it overcomes the ego will, which we term as free will. And when that is overcome, there is a spontaneous surrender. No surrender is ever true or, or total by the free will itself. It is just a repatterning. We say, I surrender my will to thee, let thy will be done. That is a mental concept, and it is blocking our own mind. Because tomorrow we go and do according to what our ego will want to do. So that is not the way. It is good for prayer. It is very good for prayer, and it has its uses. Where in that moment, in that utter emotional state, when all is lost, that's the only time people do it. When all is lost, you say, Oh God, take my will, let your will only be done. It's good as a prayer, as good as an affirmation, 
is that open? It could be a path. You're on the path towards surrender, but it is not a surrender. <coughs> surrender is a thing that has to be totally spontaneous. Otherwise, it is a conditional surrender with so many things attached. When do people want to surrender their free will to the divine will? When do they want to do it? Only when they're in trouble. When they hit their head against the wall, when they can't find any way out, all the doors are locked, which incidentally they have caused it to be locked. Then they say, oh God, I surrender, you do now. And that's a very important point. I wish more doors can be locked. More doors can be locked. But if you reach that stage, yes, of utter desperation, uh, so what have you reached there by saying that I will be done? You have reached desperation, not surrender. But this desperation, as a stepping stone, can lead one to surrender. But in the desperation, you feel helpless. It is totally helpless. You don't know what to do, so then you pass the buck. Your will not. But at this moment of desperation, then mind and body is caught for you and you then divine will enter. So what is the stumbling block that produces what we call free, free will? And what is the mind but your ego itself? I want to surrender my ego to God. Impossible. It's a mental concept. And divinity is not attained by the mind or mental concept. It is not attained that. It is attained when you reach the rock bottom. An alcoholic. He is so much in his compulsive thinking. It's company disease to him. And he said that only when he reaches rock bottom that he changes his life style. So the compulsion goes away from him. So to reach that stage of desperation or difficulty, to reach the stage of desperation is a great boon to mankind. For from there, from rock bottom, we can only turn up to it. So man cannot reach surrender. He can reach desperation. But that is the stepping stone where you allow, because the mind is gone, you allow the divine will to start doing its work. And divine will can only do its work when your mind is finished. When you are in a state, of no mind. Mm-hmm. Then there's a chance of that force, that spiritual force which we call divine will, for it to enter. It's part, it's not impeded, it is not one. Mm-hmm. And then surrender automatically happens. Surrender cannot be brought about. It automatically happens. You cannot order the grace of God grace of divinity automatically happens. Only you have to be conducive to it. Now, the easier way is this. You don't want to reach a total state of desperation for that to happen. But in our conscious state, through spiritual practices, through meditation, when we go beyond the mind, we allow the divine force to enter through us. And that brings about when the mind is pushed aside, when one transcends the mind, goes beyond the mind, 
to them the divine law will have its place. And that is called surrendering the ego. Remember, you can't surrender your ego. No. Divinity makes it surrender for you by not forcing you, but by infusing itself in your very being. Yeah? That being, that higher being, infuses itself in the lower layers of being. Yeah? And that is what the divine will is in relation to free will. Now, free will is the producer of all karma. Free will produces karma and karma produces free will. Hmm? It is a vicious circle. As I said just now, what came first, the egg or the hen? Hmm? That is the old theory behind it. And not the mental theory. Hmm? Yeah, that, that is what is. It is an is mess. Hmm? So, to be in that area where karma can be controlled. Because karma says, karma is but free will. Karma produces free will. The karmic reflection and workings of karma eh, is what we term as free will. So we can either do it through desperation, eh, or we should do it through spiritual practices. As I've said many times before, open the window and the fresh air must come in. Yeah? Open the mind and allow the fresh air to go in. The divine will to go in.